Here we go. Okay, we're live. <laughs> Yay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so happy to be here today with Monica Metz, the health, Healthy Cooking Coach. Um, I'm Dana Lavoie of Menopause Made Easy and DanaLavoieLAC.com. Monica, say hi to everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. So I've been running a healthy hormone reset for to kind of help get on the right health track for 2022. And the first week we talked about what are your choices for managing hormones and menopause symptoms, the pros and cons of each choice, and which one sets you up the best for healthy aging. And this second week of the reset that's coming to an end. Hi, everybody. I see some people are on here. I just wanted to say if you're joining us live, I would love it if you could go in the comments and say hi, let us know where you're from, and make sure you can see and hear us okay. Um, but this week has been the second week of the Healthy Hormone Re Reset, and it's been diet week. So I talked about the menopause diet blueprint, how to include the foods in your diet that your hormones really appreciate, and also what is the key to losing weight during menopause. And we shared recipes, a lot of which were from Monica. Um, and so I'm so happy to have her here today to answer questions and share information about a healthy diet. So Shannon says hi from South Dakota and Beth is here from oh. Minnesota. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. So happy to have you guys here. So we are like incredibly happy to stop and answer questions at any point today and really make this a discussion. So just type any questions or comments that you have um, in the chat for me or for Monica about anything to do, any challenges you're having with your hormones, with menopause or with with knowing what to eat or like if you know what to eat but then you find you end up eating something else that's one of the places where monica is especially helpful i can just tell you that so bring it on oh marvarine's here too hi so nice to see you and uh lily mitchell hi from portland so cool is that portland um oregon or portland maine because we're both near portland oregon uh indiana i love it this is so cool so um Anyway, uh, one of the things I thought it would be fun to kick it off with is that I know Monica and I both have feelings about is including a large enough percentage of vegetables and plant-based plant foods in your diet. Why to do it and how to do it. Um, so I don't know, what do you think, Monica? You think that's a good place to start? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think I, think I would love to hear, hear um, well, because my, my whole business is really built around helping people eat more veggies. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody knows, I think, from a standpoint of like, yes, it's heart healthy, or it'll help me maintain a healthy weight, or just whatever reasons people are motivated to eat more vegetables and mm -hmm. whole plant foods. Mm -hmm. um, but what I thought was really fas fascinating when we started talking was that, hey, there are menopause superfoods, and I just don't think that women understand yeah. Um, for the most part, like how much a more veggies diet can actually help with menopause and, mm -hmm. and why that is, you know, mm -hmm. for instance, or specifically like estrogen detox or right. um, maybe you could speak a little bit about like kind of the why and then we can yeah. get into the, you know, the nitty gritty about like, okay, well, how do I actually make it that happen at breakfast, lunch and dinner? Um, I love that. But I would love to hear your thoughts on that because I think that would really help people yeah. who work with me. Cool. And then if you have any ideas, like why do you recommend a more plant-based diet? I mean, you know, there's reasons that are ecological and, you know, yeah. unrelated to your health. So you might have a few top three reasons why you might want to eat a plant-based diet. I will tell you my reasons based on why it's helpful during menopause. Um, and there are many reasons, but big, big picture. In menopause, a lot of women have trouble because they feel hot. Right? I mean, that's the thing we all know, right? The hot flashes and the night yes. sweats. Okay. So, certain foods in the body have an effect of creating heat, right? Like they're, they warm you up when you eat them. And they also, certain foods create inflammation in the body, which turns into heat. And certain foods are acidifying to the body. You have an acid alkaline balance in your body. And an acid body is a hot body. So foods that cause inflammation, foods that 
increase acidity and foods that are hot in nature, um, they are all creating a hot, inflamed, acidic environment in your body. So when you look at your diet, if like too big a percentage of it is creating heat and inflammation and acidity, your body is just this hot environment. And you can take something for hot flashes, but like it's just so much harder to really cool yourself down in this hot environment. Whereas if you can shift, you don't have to stop eating anything completely, but if you can shift the balance, so a big enough percentage of your diet is foods that in the body create a cool, alkaline, anti-inflammatory environment in your body as a whole, it's so much easier to get hot flashes under control and not to feel hot all the time. Like it's just much, 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 much easier. So big picture, that is why. And vegetables and plant foods, um, but especially vegetables and fruits are cooling and they tend to be alkalinizing uh, and they tend to be anti-inflammatory. So they're all the things that you want for that. Whereas like meat, like I'm pro meat, like some people it's a great source of protein, but you know, you want it to be a small percentage wise to the amount of vegetables that you're eating because it heats you up, right? It's it's a warming food. Not That's not bad. You just want it in the right percentage. And then like you said, um, in menopause, when your hormones are getting uneven, a lot of the symptoms are caused by low hormones, but a lot of the symptoms are also caused just by your hormones getting out of balance with each other. And one of the reasons that happens is that estrogen gets out of balance. And so even though we're trying to build up estrogen, being able to detoxify estrogen well is really important for symptom control. And getting enough vegetables, because just fiber and good bowel movements, plus things that have special nutrients for your liver are really like broccoli sprouts, right? One of the best things you can take for estrogen detox, plus just all the fiber, just fiber is good for your bowel movements. And that's where the estrogen goes <laughs> when our bodies get rid of it ultimately. So estrogen detox, creating a cool environment. Um, and then of course, like you said, there's a lot of menopause superfoods. So special plant foods that have these micronutrients that are key building blocks for hormones that it's hard to get enough of and so it's a great way to include those and I mean you know I could go on because plants have so many plant foods have so many benefits but to me those are the big ones um, of why yeah so awesome. yeah what yeah, about yeah. you what do you think are like the best reasons to eat a lot of vegetables well well, I mean, it's interesting because uh, a lot of times people come to work with me or join my membership because they, you know, they've been diagnosed with high cholesterol and their doctor's been talking to them for several years about, hey, you really need to start making some changes or we're going to have to put you on medication. And then they finally decide, okay, I'm ready for that challenge. I want to start changing my diet. Yeah. Uh, however, you know, eat what I think also people kind of forget or they don't really know, it's not really part of our culture necessarily, that eating a predominantly plant-based diet. So like you said, it doesn't have to be 100%, but if you're eating mostly plant foods, you're going to resolve many issues potentially in the body. So, you know, anything from inflammation to hormone balancing, but then also the cholesterol issue, improving your gut health, improving your digestion, yep. just feeling better, maintaining a healthy weight. I mean, it's a, it's really a holistic approach to addressing balance in the body because it's not like, oh, I'm going to eat this way to fix my cholesterol. The great news is there are many positive side effects that, oh, Guess what? By addressing your high cholesterol, you will also in turn most likely be balancing your hormones and mm -hmm. it will be easier to maintain a healthy weight. You will feel better. You, your skin will look better. I mean, there are all sorts of positive outcomes that can right. come from that adjustment. Yep. Yeah. So there's, so if you guys have questions, anyone here has more questions about like why it's good to eat um, a higher percentage of vegetables and plant foods, let us know because we obviously like to talk about that. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about how to eat more plant-based foods. Cause it's one thing to be like, you know, um, oh, I know I should do this for my health. I know what it is I should be doing. I should be exercising a little more often. I should be meditating. I should be eating more leafy greens and like, but it just doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Another day it goes by. It doesn't happen. And so we want to give you some really 
practical tips on how to get that percentage of plant foods up. And I just noticed that this question came in from Shannon about um, tips to control sugar cravings. And I think that is a really great question that a lot of people would wanna hear the answer to. And she says, I'm eating a plant-based diet um, and trying. I know the sugar drives inflammation and more, but the cravings are real. And so I think um, we both definitely could help you out with that one. So I thought I would pop that one up and we can like talk about it while we're um, get into talking about tips for how to eat a more plant-based diet. Not why or that it's good for you, but just, okay, how am I going to do it today? Because I'm in a hurry <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think well, this is your area of expertise. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the thing to remember, um, and I work with people on this all the time, is that we, we need to be patient with ourselves and gentle with ourselves because chances are, we have been following a certain dietary protocol, whether we kind of planned that or it just kind of happens to us. Uh, there's a certain default setting that we have had for, and for most people, decades. So to all of a sudden decide overnight, well, I'm going to be vegan or, you know, I'm going to make these grand changes. I think that's really admirable. And some people can do that. But most people, probably 95% of people, that's it's not really going to work for them long term. They might be able to do it for a five day challenge or mm -hmm. vegan January, January or something like that. But mm -hmm. when push comes to shove, when we're going to a party, we're going to a friend's house, we're eating at a restaurant, we're getting takeout, we're busy mm -hmm. uh, at work or with family or other commitments, then we tend to just fall back on what we know. Right. And that's really where it gets difficult. So I always try to coach people on just thinking about adding in more vegetables to what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about and starting with the ones that you love. So I would never to say because you know, for me, broccoli is not necessarily my favorite, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though I realize it's one of the best vegetables out there. And I have had over the years, I've had to teach myself, oh, okay, like I'm never going to be the girl who digs into a bowl of steamed broccoli. Like I just, I can't do that. Like I have too many bad memories of mushy childhood broccoli, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or boiled lima beans. Like I just, I can't be that person. However, I have worked with myself to understand, okay, well, I like it roasted. Mm -hmm. I can even like chop it up really small and put it into a salad or mm -hmm. I can chop it up really small or use bro broccoli rice mm -hmm. or make a soup. I really mm -hmm. like broccoli soup. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's helpful to start with the vegetables that you already like. And actually for a lot of people, that's already broccoli. And a lot of people out there like broccoli. It's one of the most popular vegetables there is. So I would just start with a short list of maybe five vegetables that you know I like those vegetables or even I can deal with those vegetables and then just start by trying to get those into your diet on a regular basis. I mean, um, if you you guys even want to put your list of five vegetables in the oh, yeah. chat, we could give you ideas of how to use them for breakfast, snacks, I lunch, and dinner. I'll bet you we could come up with a way to include every single one of them in breakfast. So put them in the chat, your top five I love vegetables. That. <laughs> um, so adding in. So that's really the first thing is yeah. just... Don't be concerned about, oh, I got to do this overnight. Just look at your plate at any given meal mm -hmm. and ask yourself, could I get more vegetables onto my plate? Mm -hmm. Maybe you have two vegetables at dinner time. Mm -hmm. You know, that might be a big change for someone who's really not used to doing that because mm -hmm. um, the other kind of strategy that I coach people on is thinking about your vegetables first. Mm -hmm. So often we've been making our dinner. I mean, that's, you know, kind of the typical meal that we worry about making because it, you know, it's kind of the high stakes meal of the day um, because we all come together at the end of the day. There's a lot of pressure on dinner to be perfect and satisfying and flavorful and all those things. And you can get there with a mostly plant-based diet. It might take a little time to learn how to cook like that. You know, and that's kind of where I work with people. But I think it's helpful just to look at your plate and say to yourself, okay, well, usually, I mean, because people are always thinking about the chicken or the meat or the fish first. When mm -hmm. they start to think about how I'm going to make dinner, the protein comes first. When actually the protein, as you were saying before, Dana, needs to be a small portion. It's mm -hmm. really only supposed to be anywhere from 10 to 20 ish percent of your daily calories. Mm -hmm. You know, no one out there in the nutrition world is saying that your plate should be 80% protein or mm -hmm. even 50% protein. Mm -hmm. um, most people in America 
eat way more protein than they need, which creates other issues in the body. Mm -hmm. So if you think about your vegetables first, though, instead of treating vegetables like you know, the understudy or uh, the bench player, to use a sports terminology. Um, if you just even start to shift your mind around, just thinking about those veggies first, mm -hmm. that will help train you to be looking for vegetable recipes when you're browsing Pinterest or looking online or looking in a cookbook. You'll just start to think differently about them and you'll start to give them more of a starring role. And then the protein can be that kind of meat on the side Mm -hmm. you know, supporting role, mm -hmm. however you want to play that out. Um, but I think it's just helpful to change your mind around it. Like, okay, I got a plan, um, broccoli, how am I going to do that? I mean, am I going to roast that? I'm going to grill it. I'm going to chop it up into a little salad and I'm going mm -hmm. to stir fry it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's helpful if we just start to think about the veggies first. And that really does over the long term. that really just helps us think about them differently, plan for them differently, and ultimately get more of them onto our plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I did want to go back and talk to Shannon about um, sugar cravings. I mean, that there's a couple things going on, and I'm sure, you know, you have thoughts on this, too, Dana, too. Like, there's the biological craving mm -hmm. that is legitimately there, that's physically happening in your body. Um, and that actually can diminish over a few days if you don't have a refined sugar. Uh, however, that emotional urge for mm -hmm. sugar is legit <laughs> you know that <laughs> takes a while to um to kind of get your head around you know mm -hmm. journaling really working on self-awareness when mm -hmm. those impulses come up just thinking about oh gosh that's so interesting why am i craving chocolate right now mm -hmm. and just giving yourself space that's why meditation helps with a lot of this kind of stuff because mm -hmm. you can create some space between the craving that you're having mm -hmm. and the response that you're going to have to it. Mm -hmm. Cause for a lot of people, it's like craving must have chocolate. Mm -hmm. And we just, we just satisfy that right away. Mm -hmm. So meditation, awareness practices, journaling, just paying attention that can help create a little bit more space. So eventually you can just observe it and just mm -hmm. think, wow, that's so interesting. I am having the worst chocolate craving right now. Mm -hmm. What can I do instead? Yeah. Get curious I about it. Yeah, you can be curious. I can go for a walk. I can call a friend. I can go do laundry. I can physically go do something that mm -hmm. takes me out of the kitchen or away from the candy drawer. Mm -hmm. um, also, this is very obvious, but just not having it in your house. I always mm -hmm. tell people willpower is overrated. Yeah. Um, you know, sure, there's 2% of the people out there, like my mom, who can just have a house full of Doritos and chocolates and cookies and she'll have one a week and mm -hmm. she doesn't understand why everybody else can't stay away from them. I'm like, well, you're, you're a unicorn. You're different. The rest of us, I can't have that stuff in my house. Yeah. I just can't. Yeah. And um, I think with sugar cravings, there's, they can be coming from different places and you could be having all the different kinds at different times, but eating mm -hmm. sugar definitely releases chem feel good chemicals into the body that counteract stress hormones, right? Yep. So if you are, your body is craving a way to get rid of stress, it knows that a hit of sugar in the short term will do that. So that's like one possible very biological reason. And another yep. biological reason is I feel blood sugar. If your blood sugar is at all unstable and it goes low, your brain is like, I'm starving, I'm starving, I need glucose right now, you know, so low blood sugar is not a good feeling, you know, if it progresses, yep, you can yep. get hangry, you can get irritable, um, you can get shaky, you can get lightheaded, the body does not want to go down that path. And it knows that sugar is the quickest way to get the blood sugar back up. So I think eating in a way that works to stabilize your blood sugar is something that people don't talk about enough because I think a yeah. lot of us get the spikes and if you get a spike, you get a low. Some of us are prone to the lows. And so just always trying to plan for things that are going to stabilize your blood sugar also really decreases inflammation. And so, so Shannon, possible stress, possible um, low blood sugar that could be happening. Um, also, sugar is addictive. So if you have ate sugar yesterday, you can have sugar cravings that are they say in the brain it's stronger than the cravings for cocaine. I mean, it's really physically addictive. So if you've been eating it recently, 
you know, then you're going to um, crave it for a few days, like Monica said, just because you want more of what you had. Um, and then the other thing that I don't know, Monica, would be really interesting to see if you've noticed this, but I feel like there's this relationship between sugar and fat. Like a lot of times we think I'm going to eat healthy, so I'm going to eat low fat. But that often means higher sugar or mm. not enough of something else. And so we eat low fat, we end up craving and we, we just figure we're craving sugar. And I find that in women, when you look at their diets, there's an inverse relationship. The more healthy fat they eat, the less sugar cravings they have. I know this is true for me and it's true for a lot of women I know. And so I find sometimes just eating more healthy fat um, really decreases sugar cravings. And I also find if I'm having a lot of sugar cravings, the best way to get rid of them is to just get ahead of it. Be like, okay, I'm not going to have sugar cravings tomorrow. I'm going to eat a really good breakfast, a mid-morning snack, a really good lunch, a mid-afternoon snack, a really good dinner. And every time I'm going to have some protein and plenty of healthy fat and lots of vegetables. And I'm going to make sure I eat enough, right? So just not being hungry helps too. And that kind of forces your blood sugar to stay even too. So I, when I want to get off sugar, I eat more, 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 more of the good stuff. Um, I think that's so true about um, not letting yourself get too hungry yeah. also. Yeah. I think that a lot of women, especially, we've been kind of programmed, you know, all of our lives to um, to do that. You know, yeah. to, for years, I would have like a latte for breakfast or, um, you know, it's all try to about lose denial. That. Yeah, I'm going to try to lose a couple of pounds today. So I'll just eat a little tiny breakfast or I'll skip breakfast and eat a little tiny lunch. I mean, come on, when does all the eating happen? Right. Evening, right? The worst time. Like it's much better to eat more, not get too hungry, not get cravings, not get sugar cravings. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why ultimately, I mean, know that intermittent fasting can work for mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Um, but I, and but when I did it for too long, when that fasting window was too long, mm -hmm. that was kind of disastrous for me because yes. then I was starving, you know, right. and then the, when I'm starving, I can't make very good decisions. Right. You know, it's just, what do I have? Yeah. Um, and also the healthier foods don't even, they're not even really appealing when you're that hungry. You don't really want to have like a giant salad or even a smoothie. Right. So right. keeping your blood sugar stable. Yes. That's super yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. And not getting too hungry. So those are some things maybe Shannon and, you know, and, and I know we talked about um, protein a little bit, like I personally have some gut issues, so I have trouble absorbing protein from my food. So I often find that I have trouble getting enough, even though you're not supposed to need that much. And for a lot of women in menopause, their protein needs do increase a little bit actually. Mm -hmm. So it is important to make sure you're getting enough protein throughout the day. And if you're having any trouble digesting or absorbing it, which if you have any kind of compromised digestion can be a little bit more challenging with a plant-based diet, which you're on Shannon. So I would say plenty of healthy fats, make sure there's enough protein throughout the day that you're really absorbing. Um, and then um, if you're eating a plant-based diet, you're probably eating plenty of vegetables <laughs> and fruits. And there are some things too, we can just mention like on a plant-based diet, um, Monica, you probably have a lot of thoughts about this. I feel like you need to look at where your protein is coming from on a plant-based diet. Like you don't want it all coming from soy or even all coming from like nut loaves. You know, I feel like nuts are supposed right. to be like, again, a smaller percentage of the diet, whereas your actual main protein sources you know, you want to make sure that they're really well balanced and, and complete and don't have any downsides. So yeah, protein too, proteins and fats. Yeah. Cool. The nice thing is there's protein in everything. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't even talk about beans and legumes. Um, right. Exactly. And that can be a good source of both protein as well as um, fiber to keep your gut healthy. Yep. And it helps with blood so, sugar. Mm -hmm. Helps with yeah. blood sugar too. Yeah. Absolutely. And some like some grains are a lot higher in proteins than others. Yep. Um, things like even like pea proteins, right, are very well balanced proteins for humans, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So there's lots there. So Beth, um, do you see yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Beth says Brussels sprouts, carrots, zucchini, tomatoes, salads, corn, and beans. I love it. I love it. It's awesome. Um, some of these are really easy to get at breakfast. Some, some are a little bit harder. 
Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's the other thing, though, too. Like, it's cultural programming. Like, right. We've, we've all been programmed to eat something sweet for breakfast for years and years. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think especially when you get into menopause, you realize that's not necessarily serving me. I mean, there are definitely mornings where I think I need protein. I need a savory breakfast. And that's mm -hmm. when I'll kind of get into, like, my leftover tempeh mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it's usually oats. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's where we can get into a little bit of trouble again, just, you know, creating a little self-awareness about what our upbringing, what our culinary or dietary upbringing has been. Right. And just to recognize, well, maybe that might not serve you right now. And, uh, it's okay though, if you're, if you just, you're kind of scrambling and you're thinking like, oh gosh, like, I don't know what to eat now because I've always had like these sweet breakfasts just to be patient and realize, Hey, there are tons of other options out there. You can figure that out. Um, it's just going to take some time. You know, it takes it also takes time for that palate to adjust. Yeah. Oh, you know what I wanted to say to Shannon too, um, in terms of the sweet cravings, because I have a sweet tooth, like for sure. Is that sometimes I just find I do want something chocolate or I do want something sweet. It doesn't have to have any sugar in it. <laughs> you know, like it's really easy to make things that are super satisfying. You know, that don't have any sugar in them you know and they're really rich in protein and healthy fats and you know you can make smoothies you can make like little protein balls you know with coconut and dates and almond butter and um, you can make brownies with sweet potatoes and applesauce and unsweetened cacao powder and so I do like to have some really really low or no sugar healthy sweets on hand in my house because I, I do find them really satisfying and to me they're just as healthy as anything savory so um, yeah. definitely um, that's important too. and for anyone who was getting the emails this week um, yeah. I think Dana you shared the recipe for uh, cranberry coconut bliss bites yes that's one of my those are that's my go-to yeah. um, and you do get to a point where I mean right now I'm kind of sitting on this stash of Halloween type candy you know because <laughs> for our son, like, but that stuff doesn't even appeal to me anymore because once you start making your own healthy, beautiful snacks, yeah, you start, you have a stronger mind body connection to it all. And yeah. you're like, well, why would I even do that? Like right. that came from a factory. It's got high fructose corn syrup right. when in my freezer or my refrigerator, I have these amazing cranberry coconut bliss bites right. that are so good. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, full of healthy fat, protein, yep. they taste wonderful. They were inspired by, you know, the cranberry um, bliss bars at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. They don't taste like that, but that's why I created that recipe because cool. I just wanted like a healthier version with the same kind of vibe. So, um, so yeah, it's not that I never crave something sweet for sure. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've taught myself how to find it in different ways. Yeah. Like I, like I'm, um, my partner likes to have ice cream in the evenings after dinner. And so like, sometimes if I want to have something, I'll just have applesauce, like unsweetened applesauce and unsweetened coconut yogurt. And I'll put some oh, unsweetened yeah. chocolate chips in. And to me, yeah, yeah. that's like so freaking delicious. Sometimes like some dried golden berries or you know, a little bit of cut up pieces of banana or something to sweeten it. I mean, it's so delicious. Um, and I don't even miss the ice cream. So I think having like plenty of healthy sweets options for yeah. me really helps. Yeah. Um, sure. And for Beth, like for your list, like one thing I'll tell you, and I don't know, Monica, you actually posted something recently about smoothies in winter, like how to, yeah. how to make them a little less sort of icy feeling, you know, cause it's cold out. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I talk about that a lot. Um, as we get older, when we hit menopause, our digestive power becomes less. And so if we eat foods that are easier to digest more of the time, it's less work for our digestion to do. So it is able to digest things more fully. And raw foods and frozen foods and even really cold foods are more work to digest. So yep. I do really love smoothies, but I absolutely warm them up and I will put some vegetables like some, you know, salad greens or something in there, but often I will also mostly use cooked vegetables in my smoothies. Yeah. And so um 
zucchini you can put in raw or lightly steamed carrots are really really great if they've been steamed um those and salads you can put in smoothies so you can put and beans you can put like a quarter cup of be not maybe ones that are cooked with a ton of spices but just like plain beans i learned that from dr alan christensen you just put like a quarter cup of beans in your smoothie you'll never know they're there and they give you it really gives it staying power mm -hmm. <laughs> it's great for your blood sugar and it's filling and it's got extra protein and um so a lot of those would be great in a smoothie i don't know about brussels sprouts in a smoothie if you put in too many i don't really think that would be my go-to <laughs> but um but uh definitely almost everything else and so yeah so there you go beth those are some maybe ways you didn't think of and plus you could make like you could grate the carrots and zucchini and make like a healthy loaf like a you know, like a bread, like a zucchini bread, kind of carrot cake kind of thing. That would be, that would be really good. So if you're thinking of different ways to get these veggies in. <laughs> yeah. And, um, smoothies for sure. I mean, some of the tips are to just not make it so frosty, you know, to yeah. use maybe some thawed out, um, frozen fruits or veggies, um, or to let your smoothie be more room temperature or sometimes well, I like, drink when my body's warm, when I'm hot, yeah. you know, after working out. Yeah. If I'm putting frozen stuff in, I'll use hot liquid. Yeah. I, I heat up the milk or the water or the juice or whatever, and then it just comes out like room temperature. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good idea because it just yeah. balances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but also oats. Uh, yeah. Like when winter comes, mm -hmm. uh, I find that's a great place to sneak in some veggies. So mm -hmm. cauliflower rice is my favorite. I just mm -hmm. put it in everything now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of those sneaky ways to get more veggies into what you might already love. So if you, uh, if you're cooking for your family and you know, they're not necessarily on the eating more veggies train, um, yeah. cauliflower rice is kind of my go-to sneak it in. So I put that in everything. You can put it in stir fries. You can make what I think of as 50, 50 rice, which is, you know, you cook normal rice, but then you also have your cooked cauliflower rice and then you put those together and it's kind of half and half. Yep. Um, because I also, I don't particularly love like a base of just cauliflower rice. Mm. The consistency kind of isn't there for me. So, um, but I, you know, I can have it in my oats. I do that most mornings or I can have it in a stir fry. I can definitely put it in a soup mm -hmm. um, or a stew or a chili or a pasta sauce. Um, it's extremely versatile and very, very mild in flavor. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so, so yeah, like for smoothies, um, and oats, uh, cauliflower rice, grated zucchini, grated mm -hmm. carrots. Mm -hmm. um, those are great things. Pumpkin puree, yep. unsweetened pumpkin puree or sweet potato sweet puree. Potato. Yep. Really great to incorporate into oats or smoothies. Yep. Yep. And you can just, that's the way it's like you're having a smoothie, but you're having not just a handful of like spinach, but really some additional vegetables as well. So getting in mm -hmm. like not one, but three servings of vegetables, like yeah. at each meal, that kind of thing. Um, Leah has a really good tip too. She says uh, she shifted her exercise from the morning to the afternoon and her diet mag magically improved and her energy is better during the day. And plus she's busy at the time when she would normally be snacking. So I really like that idea. That's a really, sometimes just those little practical things are so awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Stacy said she loves making uh, energy balls for sugar cravings. Me too. There are so many good recipes out there. Monica has a bunch mm -hmm. of them on her website. I love energy balls, especially like I said, cause they, it's really easy to put a lot of healthy fats in there as well. And it's like, you get that little craving, that little hunger, that little dip, and you just reach for a couple of those and not only do they taste really satisfying but instead of spiking and crashing your blood sugar the way a little like snickers bar would they actually stabilize your blood sugar and feed you a steady stream of energy for hours so yeah i'm a big fan <laughs> speaking of energy bites um we we had talked uh about flaxseed Yes. earlier this week, Dana, and I wanted to give a special shout out to flaxseed. Yes. <laughs> My favorite menopause um, superfood. <laughs> it's a menopause superfood. Um, so easy to incorporate into your energy bites uh, or your oats. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a great ingredient to use in your everyday cooking. So I try to have it once a day, at mm -hmm. least in either my oats. And if I don't have oats that day, I just kind of put it in something. Mm -hmm. 
I totally agree with you. They have some the highest amount of any food of something called lignans, which is the special micronutrient that's like amazing for your hormones. Like I have some women who just start eating two tablespoons of freshly ground flax seeds every day and their hot flashes go away. Like it's not going to work on all hot flashes, but it's definitely yeah. going to give you a nudge in the right direction and kind of set the stage for hormonal balance. And it's pretty awesome. And um, so definitely one to consider. And it's amazing how good they taste. You can, like you said, you can sprinkle them on a soup and they're almost like mm -hmm. Parmesan cheese or something. They give like a nice texture and they kind of disappear into it and it's just a little bit of a nutty flavor and they can go sweet, they can go savory. You can sneak them in all over the place. Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. And we had, uh, let's see. Looking at the questions. Yeah. Me too. Um, well, I was wondering if we could talk about, uh, and we did kind of gloss over it, but Beth's question about, I don't eat meat fish, but what are healthy proteins? Oh, yeah. Um, for us, menopausal and postmenopausal babes. Um, so what are your thoughts on, I am soy friendly, and I'm not necessarily, because uh, there's a lot of data to support that soy is protective for women in terms of reducing breast cancer risk. Mm -hmm. Also, it can help uh, with hot flashes for some women, mm -hmm. not everybody, but for the people it works for, it works. Right. Um, and so I'm not one to say like, hey, you should be having soy foods every day. I'm really more of like a couple times a week kind of person. Um, however, I think it's really kind of an undervalued food for people trying to get a little bit more protein into their diet. Like tempeh is extremely versatile. I love cooking yeah. with it. Um, Sometimes I think that can be easier for people to work with as opposed to tofu because it's right. tempeh is kind of a meatier texture right. and it's also uh, less processed. It's fermented. Um, it's fermented. Yeah. So yep. it's in a, this cake, mm -hmm. you know, you can see the intact soybeans mm -hmm. uh, and I find it really easy to work with, easy to find, mm -hmm. uh, you can marinate it, you can roast it like you roast chicken. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a fun ingredient to work with. So I'm curious though, like kind of what are your thoughts on soy, Dana? So um, my thoughts on soy, I have, I do have a blog post on this if anyone's interested in like, I think it's called like, I don't know, estrogen rich foods done right or something like that. So mm -hmm. it's definitely something I've looked into. Soy is one of the foods that is the highest in phytoestrogens, plant estrogens, which are definitely one of the things that can help women during menopause. The downside of soy is that uh, if it's not organic, it tends right. to be GMO and grown with a lot of pesticides. That's one issue. Yep. Yep. Another significant issue with soy, it is one of the most common foods for people to be sensitive to or allergic to if you have any food sensitivities or allergies. And if you eat a food that you have a sensitivity to, it creates a lot of inflammation in the gut, which damages nutrient absorption and creates inflammation in the body and all kinds of not so, like you don't want to be eating something that you have an active sensitivity or um, allergy to. And it's one of the top like seven foods, I think, for food sensitivities. So some people don't have that, which is awesome, but some yeah. people do. The other issue with soy is that it is a little bit notoriously hard to digest. And so um, if your digestive system isn't super robust, eating too much of it can create sort of a strain. Um, and so the other things about soy that I really, really like is if you eat like, again, not these huge amounts of it. I think if you eat really, really large amounts of it, like it's your main protein every single day, then it's gonna compound the negative effects. Whereas if you eat it in moderation, and especially if you eat it in, fer in fermented form, in tempeh and miso and natto, um, that's really been shown to be easy to, to uh, digest, easier to absorb. Um, so it's not so difficult for your digestion or for your immune system if you're sensitive to it. So those are the those are the pros and cons. So like you said, it works for some women. They're not allergic or sensitive to it, and they can digest it okay. Mm -hmm. In which case, make sure you're using organically grown soy. I think yes. that's important when it comes to soy more than some other foods. Very important when it comes to soy. Don't maybe use it as your you know like glasses and glasses of soy milk every day and tofu yeah, as yeah. your main you know protein every day i do think there can really be a downside to it and if you're sensitive to or allergic to it then 
the cons outweigh the pros for you. So yeah. it's an individual. Yeah, yeah for, for sure. sure. Um, um, but for other proteins, Beth, I mean, like, it depends on your sense, like how you do with a lot of different foods and how you absorb them, right? It's not about what you eat. It's about what you get out of it, right? So I think if you have digestive issues, it's harder to absorb proteins from plant foods. I do believe that. Um, and so there are a lot of women who find like a little bit of, you know, meat or fish. Again, we talked about percentages. Like I don't necessarily, like I think for some menopausal women, that can be um, a really nice, easy source of protein um, or eggs or something like that. But in terms of just non-meat or fish proteins, you know, if you're not doing eggs, there are all the things that we talked about, Monica, right? Like you can get hydrolyzed pea protein powder. That is a very complete protein for humans. And also some of the um, ones made with uh, like uh, spirulina, chia seeds, uh, hemp seeds, I think are also uh, good sources of protein, but you want them to be combined into a complete protein. Um, uh, so yeah, so those are just some general thoughts about ways you could get like a little protein boost. Um, and I don't know, Dana, maybe you could speak to this. I find that a lot of people that I work with are actually sensitive to eggs. I mean, it's my understanding yeah. that eggs are really high up on the list as well. Really high, right up there um, with soy. Certainly are for me, so I can't really do eggs. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's just important to realize there are a lot of options out there that might not be that familiar to us yet, um, but I use hemp seed a lot as well. Hemp seed and spirulina are both mm -hmm. great sources of protein. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. And let's see, um, do any other questions? Domina here. What if I avoid soy, high quality protein powder, avocado, nuts, seeds, beans, and egg in my diet, possibly enough to get enough protein? Yeah, I mean, if you're using protein powder and like avocado is a great source of healthy fats. I don't think it has a lot of protein. Um, Fiber. Yeah. Surprisingly. Yeah. yeah. I know even though it's mushy, nuts have some, seeds can have a good amount. Beans are a great source of protein. I believe that beans, Monica, am I correct? They need to be uh, combined like that beans and rice are a complete protein and beans alone aren't a complete protein. That's one of the issues you run into why you want to vary your protein sources. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've heard that that's kind of, um, we thought that for a long time, but mm -hmm. now that what they're figuring out and how the body can has the ability to, and this is totally oversimplifying, but it can recycle amino acids. Yeah. And turn them into um, what we need. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of less important, the whole like combining rice and beans. Although yeah, it's a great combination, it's not yeah, really not necessary as anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we don't we have, have to worry about, about, you know, you know put beans in your salad, salad or put beans in your smoothie. smoothie. Um, you're right. still going to get that benefit. Yeah, yeah. I think if you're eating the legumes and a high quality protein powder and nuts and seeds, and some of the seeds like hemp seeds we talked about are especially high Chia and hemp are especially high in protein. As long as you're including all of those and like rotating around and like even quinoa, some of the seed like grains, grains have protein too, and some of yep, them yep. more than others. So that's something to think about too. Um, so yeah, you can, you can definitely get enough. You just, yeah, I, I definitely think it's possible. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. And we had a couple of questions that had come in. Monica, was there... I, we had those questions that came in ahead of time. Yes. Yeah. Um, questions about uh, bone loss and osteoporosis medications. Are they really yeah. necessary? Exactly. And also, does all of this, what we're talking about, let's say someone's not in their 40s, 50s, 60s going through menopause, but they're actually in what they call early ovarian failure. Right. Is the protocol the same? Right. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Uh, so early ovarian failure and menopause have definitely some things in common. Um, when you are at your highest level of fertility, like when you're 18 years old or 21 years old, you know, your female hormones, your hormones are at the highest that they're going to be in your life. And when you go through menopause, your hormones drop. 
And what happens is they start dropping actually um, around age 28. And they drop slowly, 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 and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And then we start to feel it. And now we say we're in perimenopause, right? And then they get to this point. They just pass this point where our period stops, right? It's like they're already dropping. They've dropped a bit, but then they drop to this critical point where our period stops. And the whole time they're dropping, your fertility is going down, like your ability to have children easily or conceive easily is going down. Once you hit that point where you stop having your period, then, you know, your fertility is sort of like all the way down, all the way down. Um, and ovarian and in Chinese medicine, which is what my background is in, that um hormone those hormone levels are what we call your jing which is like your life energy and you have this reserve of it and honestly some people are born with more than other people and some people use it up faster than other people by like burning the candle at both ends by not sleeping by being super stressed out you know working three jobs whatever um, so the amount of jing that you have left in your energy reserves, it's like your battery pack. That's like your life potential. It's like how much life you have left in you because when it runs out, that's when you die. And so that is pretty much directly reflected in your level of fertility because like everything that's a sign of aging means your jing is going down. Your hormone levels are going down. Your life force is going down. Um, and so hormones are very much like that. So for someone who has tons and tons of that life force energy, they're gonna be the people who have a baby when they're 48 years old, <laughs> okay? Whereas for other people who have less of that life energy, either they were born with less of it or they used it up quickly, they might get to the point where their hormones are so low at age, you know, 31 that it's hard for them to conceive. So that level of fertility is your ovarian reserve is the same as the amount of hormone levels that you have. It's your life energy. And, you know, my thing is we want to keep it as high as we can for as long as possible. Even postmenopause, if you have a little bit more hormones rather than less, you're going to experience so many fewer signs of aging. So low ovarian reserve is just like your hair going gray when you're really young. It could be genetic. It could be because you like super burned the candle at both ends or got super stressed out, but your life energy just dropped down. And so um, you want to bring it back up, whether it happens early on or later, you want to bring it back up because the more you can bring it back up, the younger you're going to feel. <laughs> if it tends to drop really, really early, like a woman who finds out she has it when she's trying to conceive and she's quite a bit younger, then there's more likely to be a genetic component. But that doesn't mean you can't still work with it. You can't still build it up. It just means it's a little bit different than someone who maybe is trying to have a baby when they're 48 or 50 years old. And then it's like your genetics might be totally normal and it's low just because of your age is a little bit more advanced and it's natural for it to be lower. But in either case, you can work on building it up. So some of the things you would use to build it up are going to be the same, but because the root cause of why it's low, like genetics or your age are different, part of the treatment would be different. So there's a lot of similarities. Um, and uh, let's see, was there more? Was there more to that question, do you think, about the ovar ovarian failure? Um, or, or, or well, just uh, it's, it's more, more about, about like, like, are, like, like some, some of these nutritional, nutritional things, things, would that, would that kind of be the same protocol, protocol like eating a mostly plant-based diet, diet, you know, getting your protein, protein um, those types, types of things, things we talked about. about. You I'm know, assuming that it would help someone who's younger, but kind of going through the same things, having hot yeah. flashes, yeah. anxiety. You would, yeah, you would want to eat a diet that helps your body make more hormones. Mm -hmm. And you would want to eat a diet that helps your body hold on to the hormones that you have. Like if you have a lot of stress or a lot of inflammation, um, you know, or a lot of like gut un unhealthy stuff and inflammation going on in your gut and you're not absorbing nutrients, right? Like these are all things where you're like leaking away hormones, right? So you want to create an environment in your body where it can make hormones as efficiently as possible. So getting all those horm hormonal building blocks in your diet, the healthy fats and all that, and you know, detoxing well. And it's, so yeah, absolutely, it's going to help at any age. Though I will say that in Chinese medicine, if you're having this kind of an issue with, it's like your deepest, your fertility is like your deepest level of your life force. Like it's not, you know, 
like even your immune system is a higher level, right? This is like your bone marrow, not your muscle. This is like your, what's in the middle of you, you know, that feeds everything else. So seeds are really good for it, right? Because it's like the seed that sprouts into other mm -hmm. things. But if you look in like Chinese medicine, you would be recommended to also include some animal foods in your diet and even in some of your herbs. Those are going to be some of the most powerful things. And again, not a large percentage of your diet, but okay. you would include, like, you could include bone broth. You could include a little bit of meat or, you know, marrow or, you know. So some of the animal foods in small amounts would be recommended as well, seafood and meat. So, yeah, okay. if you're really, really struggling with those deeper levels of energy, um, the plant-based diet, like, is really cooling, but those deepest levels of energy can be your fire that's missing too. So sometimes mm -hmm. it helps to eat just a richer diet. So, yeah. Um, also, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask about the question about um, osteoporosis medications. Yes. Are they truly necessary for all women going through menopause? Or what's your take on that? Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to um, address that. So I would never, ever tell anyone to stop taking a medication that their doctor recommended or not take a medication that their doctor recommended. Like, I'm, you know, not your doctor. And you know, so I don't know what's going on with your situation. So that being said, my general thoughts on osteoporosis are, <laughs> so again, it's a sign of aging, right? Even if it happens to you young, it is a sign that your energy reserves are low. Okay. And when you get certain signs of aging, like in Chinese medicine, your energy reserves are made up of fire energy and water energy. And they both support different things in your body. The water supports like the blood and the bone marrow, but bones themselves are very supported by fire energy. And so you're going to need some of the more warming herbs and warming foods to support them. And there's a lot you can do. There's even an herb called eucomia that um, really helps the body to re-regulate how much bone is being laid down and taken reabsorbed by the body, which is what tends to change in osteoporosis. So there are a number of ways that herbal remedies can approach uh, helping with osteoporosis. And there are even formulas used for women with osteoporosis where they've done clinical studies and they've shown over one or two years, like three to five increase in the percentage mm. of bone mass, which is as good or better than medications, but it's very dense, strong bone because the, here's the thing about the medications. They work by preventing the body from being able to take bone away because the body is always laying down new bone cells and reabsorbing old bone cells. That's how the bones stay healthy. And the way that the medications get your bones bigger is by preventing the body from being able to take away bone. That's why you end up with this, like you can be on the medication and your bones can get much bigger and you are still can be very prone to like spontaneous stress, stress fractures because your bones are not healthy, strong bone. And so mm -hmm. the other problem is that the potential side effects from those medications are very, very severe very very severe so like a lot of doctors i follow like aviva ram and christian northrup who's like a expert in menopause and has been for such a long yep. time their mds aviva ram was trained at yale you know they're yeah, top, great. top of the line like medical doctors who have an alternative approach to women's health when you find people like that and they they post a blog saying the medications the top three or the top five medications prescription medications i would never take bisphosphonates are always on the list those are wow. the osteoporosis medications they say it's not worth it it doesn't actually make your bones stronger and the side effects are like absolutely freaking huge and so there are a lot of things in my experience you can do to support your bones without using bisphosphonate medications that i believe can leave you in a better place in the end. Um, but you it's really probably more of a commitment, like you said, of lifestyle, of diet, of getting your body into a place where it is an environment where it can make hormones. And even hormone replacement therapy can be helpful, can be really helpful for bones. And bioidenticals can be have way more pros than cons. You know, so that's where I would go first. Plus herbs. Herbs are really powerful for that. Um, yep. So I'm not a fan of 
like all the most of the osteoporosis medications are are in this class of drugs called bisphosphonates and i personally mm-hmm. have, you know some medications i'm like whatever you know great but that's one where i would say if you can find an alternative it's one of the ones i say try really hard to find an alternative because i kind of believe yeah. that the cons outweighed the pros because the pros are not actually very significant mm-hmm. um so i would dig a little deeper into that one and maybe get a second opinion yeah. yeah, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And when you say long-term bone damage from menopause, it's true that we tend to get this from low hormone levels, but that's like my whole approach is, yeah, you want to get relief from hot flashes during menopause, but what I feel like I really help women with more is how to take care of your hormones post-menopause in all the years after menopause. If you can keep your hormone levels high enough, so many and your inflammation levels low enough right that combination Mm -hmm. it's like the fountain of youth it's like so many signs of aging and diseases of aging are just so much less likely to happen to you and keeping the hormones high enough is like key for menopause for bone for keeping your bones strong so um if you have like bone loss like low libido tends to go along with that low metabolism feeling cold all the indicators of low fire Mm -hmm. energy in your body yeah so um, there's a lot you can do about it. Yeah. Cool. cool. Any other questions? This has been so fun. Yeah. Looking at the comments. We have, we have someone here who says, I love eggs and they don't love me back. I know, right? <laughs> That's me. And then, and then someone says, I avoid soy, right? Like, I, I'm not a soy person. It doesn't like me. So, yeah, you just got to go. You got to listen to your body because if you do eat foods that you're reacting to, it's just inflammation and poor absorption like it's you can heal your gut so if you can heal your gut to the point where you don't react to them great but until you get to that point i would have to say maybe better not to eat them even though they're a healthy food which kind of leads people are probably wondering like okay well how do i um because you mentioned protein absorption as well as uh food sensitivity so is there a certain panel that you recommend for people or should they visit their natural path to have a certain screening? Like, how do you work with your own patients you know, on that? I find that if you have serious gut issues, you're probably going to want to find somebody to work with to help you navigate that. Mm-hmm. Um, the GI map is my favorite test just because I've had the best results from it personally in terms mm-hmm. of figuring out what's actually going on in your gut. Do you need enzymes? Do you need probiotics? Which ones? Is your gut you know, membrane damage? Do you have any kind of pathogen or infection? Like I just find that gives you the most useful information and it's the most accurate. Um, And in terms of food sensitivities, I, I honestly think that an elimination diet can be just as good or better than testing. And so doing an actual elimination diet or something like the whole, you can either eliminate the top five to seven or 10 allergens, or you can eliminate like most of them and then you just add them back in one by one like something like the whole 30 right yeah Um, is like a really great elimination diet uh and they have so much resources for that um and then there are some other common things you can avoid as well if you want um just get to find something on which you have none of the reactions and then add add things in one at a time like every three to five days yeah I think that's great, a great way to go. Like if someone's like, well, should I stop eating gluten? You know, it's like, well, stop for 30 days. And if you feel absolutely 100% the same, then no. If Mm -hmm. magically you feel something, symptom completely disappears and you feel so much better, then yes. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So yeah, elimination diet and, you know, probiotics or I'm kind of a believer in fermented foods and probiotics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? You must work with people who have digestive issues in your in your coaching programs. Yes. Um, and it's kind of a journey that I've been on for a long time. Uh, and it has taken me, you know, a long time to figure out what's going to work for me, what doesn't work for me. And sometimes that can change. Um, but I generally find, you know, when people get away from the processed foods and just start introducing those whole plant foods into their diet on a daily basis and increasing that fiber gradually because i guess we didn't even talk about that's you know we don't want to go from zero to 60 overnight right uh because our digestive system is not going to be ready for uh raw kale all the time or um, especially during winter you know during winter our vegetables 
for most people need to be cooked or lightly yeah. steamed or enjoyed that way. So um, again, an, another plug for kind of going slow on this to try yeah. to figure out what's going to serve you best and, you know, try, especially beans, if you're not used to eating beans, then, you know, you're going to want to have very small amounts to begin with. And that can increase over time yep. um, for most people. But, um, but yeah, like it's a big experiment, right? Yeah. I mean, because at the end of the day, there is no Bible of diet, you know, that's going to work for everybody. It's going to look a little bit differently for most people. But really, the common consensus is that a vegetable rich or uh, a diet that's rich in whole plant foods is going to serve most people the best. Definitely. Like I said, it's like not it's about the percentage. It's at the big you yeah. know, 50, 80 percent of your diet is plant mm -hmm. foods. If you want to eat a little something else in the other percentage, that's fine. You know, it's about the yeah. percentages and that overall balance, anti-inflammatory cooling balance in your body. And then, yeah, about not eating the things that don't agree with you, but at the same time, healing your gut to, so you yeah. can eat them. Right? So it's, yeah. it's like not to try to limit your diet more over time, to just limit it enough to calm down the inflammation and then heal your gut. And the goal is always to reintroduce as many foods as possible. Yeah, I think that message is especially important, Dana. I mean, I was just talking to someone who um, had some food sensitivity testing and found out they were allergic to like everything. Yep. When, and you know, that was kind of their takeaway, like, what am I going to do? I can't eat anything except for, you know, meat and tuna or something, right. you know, random. And it's like, well, um, there's kind of a larger context for that in that, um, that your gut is inflamed or you're having right. a gut issue and then eventually you will be able to broaden what you can eat yes. but it's really addressing the healing that needs to take care yes. uh you take care of the gut because if we're not talking um a legitimate allergy food allergy right that's going to cause you know an anaphylactic response right like peanuts. Um, the sensitivity thing is different yeah. you know it still means that like when you eat those foods you're not going to feel well right um, but there is hope because, yes. you know, you can heal from that in the future and yeah. enjoy your favorite foods once again, but exactly. it, it does take some time. It's a journey. But, but to, if you're on a limited diet because you found you're sensitive to a lot of foods to actively work at healing your gut yeah. and, and keep every three months, see, can I introduce a few foods back now? Have I healed yeah. my gut enough? Cause I think expanding, I mean, not including, you know, like trans fats and high fructose corn syrup. Doritos. Don't, don't ever like you don't ever need those but seeds and nuts and beans and yeah. like you know meats and eggs and soy and whatever like the more you can expand your diet without reacting the better so yeah. actively have gut healing as a part of what you're doing if you're on a limited diet think of a limited diet as temporary yes yeah cool well, this has been so fun. Um, you guys, if anyone watching the replay, the recording, please don't hesitate to send in questions and we'll get back to you um, and we'll go from there. All Sounds right. good. Well, this has been a really fun conversation. Thanks for having me. Again. Yeah. And Cheryl just popped on. She said it's so difficult trying to figure out um, because now everything is irritating my gut. Yeah. When you're in that kind of a place, try to find a base diet where you're not having symptoms and then you test foods one at a time. The Whole30 might be a good place to start. That's a pretty good elimination diet. And there's tons of free resources for it online. Um, and so, and there's a vegetarian version and a non-vegetarian version. So I like it for that too, but look for elimination diets and see if you can mm -hmm. find one you, where you feel really well. Um, and then work at healing the gut. Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much for joining us and Thanks, uh, everyone. We'll, we'll talk to you soon, Monica. Thank you again. And you guys, we're going to post Monica's information because she has so many good recipes on her website and she has, um, a coaching online program where you can learn about like meal prep and tons of recipes and like if you want to start eating healthier but it's just not happening and you need like all the resources and support and help at your fingertips you know she can absolutely help you with that in the least painful way possible like it's it's actually really fun and delicious and it's she like she said it's not like you know, she's so practical about it. Like, I understand yeah. you're busy. Like, here's what might work if you only have three minutes. Like, she's still got really good ideas. So I highly recommend that you check it out. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.